Good afternoon, folks. All right. Well, if you're, uh, there's still plenty of seats here, so um, you know, please uh, find a comfortable one. Uh, one of the great things about this theater is there's hardly a bad seat in the whole place. Um, my name is Kevin Quinn, and I have the honor of serving as the president of Aquinas College, uh, one of the many uh, benefactors of the of the Weggie Foundation. And I want to welcome you to Aquinas College and the 23rd annual Weggie Foundation Speaker Series. Since it's yes. Since its inception, Aquinas has joined the foundation in sponsoring this series, and we are delighted to collaborate with the foundation and with the West Michigan Environmental Action Council in doing so again this year. Usually it's held in April, but this year we held it in winter. <laughs> I would like to thank our partnering organizations who helped with the planning and the public outreach, and they're listed in the program here. There's a lot of them. And I'd like to ask you to join me in a round of applause, uh, a round of applause to thank them. I'd also like to extend a special welcome to the Weggy Foundation trustees and members of the Weggy family who are in Grand Rapids this week for the foundation meetings and who have joined us uh, for this afternoon's lecture. Um, if you're uh, a trustee or a member of the family, if you're able, please stand up so we can recognize and thank you. Well, I kind of feel like the Fresh Prince here. Um, this afternoon, we have an unconventional introduction of our speaker. We have a special performance by All of the Above Hip Hop Academy. The Academy is a not-for-profit organization of artists, educators, and advocates that builds culture, creates community, and provides opportunities for youth through hip hop. Please help me in welcoming the All of the Above Hip Hop Academy. How y'all doing today? Y'all hey. doing good? Now, guys, how y'all doing today? Hey. There you go. Yes. All right, we are um, and all the Above Hip Hop Academy, our group that we have that's performing today. We call ourselves Peace in a Clip. Um, and we just have a couple tracks for you guys to introduce. Oh, we have, I mean, well, one track to introduce the man, the legend, Mustafa Santiago Ali. And uh, first, we'd like to give a, th a big thank you to Aquinas College and the Weggie Foundation for putting us here tonight and allowing us to perform. All right. Anybody got anything else to say? Anybody else to say? No. Oh, yeah. All right. Track. Spin that. Environmental it's justice. Yeah. Environmental Yes, sir. Hey. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. There needs to be change. Listen, change's only in to bring people in pain. Oh, dang. Oh, dang. So many things that affect our communities, but none has seemed so really deep. I don't even know if we should even speak, but if we don't, then change, change will never be seen. Let me teach another lesson right here on this beat. That's like the hardest trial, trial of, of our lives. lives. Cause the area we live in just, just ain't right. right. Why? Cause they don't care about lies that don't make more than a thousand a day twice. Or, or thrice. thrice. Or even four times for, for that, that matter. matter. Cause if we don't make that much cheddar, then, then we, we don't, don't matter. matter. Playing with our communities like, like the Mad Hatter. Hatter. Met us with something that has to get better. Why my cousin live across the street from factories? Why my friend is in the hills next to pine trees? The president knows that these, these industries, industries are making easy things like breathing hard for me. But I guess we are not worth it. President even said we can leave a, a little, little bit. bit. Meaning that we can keep suffering. Or because we don't make as, as much, much as his kids. kids. Well, maybe that, that was, was just an, exaggeration. an exaggeration. But what is not is the cause that it's making. With the change and by the percentage of two. Meaning it's gonna get colder, colder than ice cube. Man, what are we, we even gonna, gonna do? do? Summer gets so hot that we can fry steak too. 
but we the ones that really get fried because the pollution is coming straight, straight for our eyes. eyes. You ask me, why don't you move away, little guy? Well, I ask, why do I have to move my life away from people who make millions, millions in, in the night? night? Which I need to do is change, change our minds. minds. More polluted than the industries, the was guys. Work to make our living place more safe so we can sleep and live in the healthy days. Because if you ask me how you doing us, it's insane. insane. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Rock. There needs to be change. Listen, change only the end of bringing people in pain. Oh, dang. Oh, dang. Uh, we'll dominate the struggles in the system of weak. Greed only shares tears to keep the people at sea. Oh, dang. Oh, man. Uh huh. Leon the Lion King, about to let you know that the environment's an OG. It was here before we were, so, so let's go see. The issues that happen in these areas, they lead to like arm barriers, they're stereo. And what's heavier is the air pollution, here's the solution. Follow the people moving, we proving that we can make a change. So let's arrange a way to stop this issue. Let's separate from fossil fuels, they being cool. Take out the coal, we gon' patrol, stop the recoil. Like something getting flame broiled. Then we got lead in the water, lead in the water. We all need that good water. Layer water's causing the slaughter on your daughter. They don't care if it's hotter. They don't want to waste a dollar. They don't want to be proper. We struggle with bad water. Why they happen? You're smiling like Mr. Rogers. These are just two of the issues that need to be stopped. There's plenty more, but I ain't tackling them all in this verse. I'm just saying they need to be chopped and swapped for a better outcome. Because if not, it's going to possibly put fellow people of this land in a hearse. Not today. We're going to make it submit. Put it in the ankle lock like Kurt. Uh -huh. It won't even get the R.I.P. on the shirt. No, yeah. this, this gotta, gotta be heard. There needs, needs to be change. change. Listen, change only end up bringing people in pain. Oh, dang. Yeah. Oh, dang. Yeah. We'll, we'll dominate, dominate the struggles in the system of weak. Greed only shares tears to keep the people at sea. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. What's up? <laughs> I won't lie, times change, marginalize the light of day, won't see the sky, they keep us down, ignore our rights, don't see the town, just see the town that they got, got it right, right. Uh -huh. yeah, <laughs> people frown but never fight, you see these, these clowns, clowns, they dreaming right, we, we got, got the crown, crown and it's on tight. tight, don't need to change, let's keep things same, mold like clay, the pot confines, Divine. golden uh -huh. mines, just make them dig till they, they get, get tired high. and start to cry, while we invest in places high, like a kite that shrinks beside, there's no way I won't despise, Meanings that, that I'll write, write my, my lines. lines. Shape your vision, sights we climb. Metaphors, the mountain tops, cause it's so all written in the line. line. Written in the line. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. huh. yeah, corner store, liquor more, bring, bring it. it. They keep us poor, no, no food, food up on the dishes. dishes. Who's in charge? We telling them to bring it. Uh -huh. We gon' rise and, and tell, tell them more to stick, stick it. it. We gon' make ourselves heard and you're listening. Confidence is only in the distance. Try to break us, but will you be willing to take the town from, from our, our humble beginnings? beginnings. We'll dominate the struggles in the system of weak. Greed only shares tears to keep the people at sea. Oh, oh man. Oh, man. Yeah. I, I don't know what's coming from that plant, but it's a stench that you've never smelled before. I mean, it is, it is horrible. Oh, horrible. Oh, horrible. Oh, horrible. We have a high rate of cancer here. We have a high rate of leukemia here. We have high rates of a lot of things that we don't have answers to. When plants come here, they're bringing us jobs. You're bringing us jobs, but at the same time, you're killing us. No, like I said, as long as they're making that money, as long as they're making that money, they don't care. All they're going to do is be successful in driving away people like me, who have the ability to stay here, to pay the taxes, to buy them off, they're going to drive us the hell out of here. And those of us that they don't drive them off, they're going to kill them. They're going to kill them. They're going to kill them. Power to the people. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's give them another round of applause. It's an honor to be here with you. Thank you to the Weggy Foundation. Can we give them another round of applause? It's incredible. To the family. We're going to take a journey uh, over the next about 60 minutes. 
Well, I was born in a family of Baptists and Pentecostal ministers, so I should tell the truth. Maybe about the next four hours we'll have a conversation. <laughs> um, but before we do that, I want to ask you guys to do me a favor. I want everybody to just close your eyes. If you could close your eyes for a second. Don't peek. You know, you know nobody's going to get you. I want you to remember a time when you believed that everything was possible. Some folks are going to have to think a little harder than others, but take your time and remember when you believed everything was possible. Then I want to transition real quickly, and I want you to remember your favorite song, and I want you to remember how that made you feel. Where did it take you? How did it change your perceptions and your life? And you can open your eyes because I don't want anybody to fall asleep. <laughs> but I also want you to think about how culture has the ability to actually build bridges between folks, how it gives us an opportunity to enter into a similar space to appreciate that blessing that God sends to us many times in the form of music and dance. Uh, it could be through visual arts. There's so many different ways that, that we're blessed. And that gives us that chance, that moment, hopefully that minute, that hour, that day, to find some commonality and to use that as an opportunity to build. Sometimes this beauty finds special places to find fertile ground. And I'm going to share with you all real quickly before I give you my brief, brief presentation. <laughs> um, some brothers and sisters who folks sometimes wouldn't necessarily associate uh, with hip hop um, or with some of the changes that are happening. So we're going to share with you a video that we uh, joined into that we won an MTV Music Award with from someone by the name of Taboo. How many folks know who the Black Eyed Peas are and were? Okay, look at everybody. It's like, yes, I'm in. <laughs> so this is a video called Stand Up for Standing Rock. As anyone knows, some of the challenges that folks have been facing uh, in trying to help to protect water, but also to bring culture uh, into the process. So we're going to start with Stand Up for Standing Rock. This is Taboo and the Magnificent Seven. They call it a pipeline, but those on the front lines know that black snake was sent for us to grow, to shed the skin our ancestors pray, of wounds old and calloused so that we may stay, so that we may unite, unity our tool. No weapons are found in this court of rule. Men becoming ki'ai, steadfast in their guard, protecting women's hearts as their song become roots, roots to cast out healing for all sentient beings, to honor sacred mother, heart forward we heal. The salmon will run, the mountain will breathe, the rivers will flow. The rainbow is here and prophecy tells us all generations will hear. Nations and our people that been living here for thousands of years. Stand up. We've been fighting for our freedom since the Nina and the Pinta and the Santa Maria. Stand up. Like Geronimo, Sitting Bull, Red Cloud, Crazy Horse, Leonard Peltier. Stand up. Now they poisoning the waters for our sons and our daughters, so we on the frontier. We won. One nation, one cause, one people, one tribe. Now it's us against the pipeline. Get on your feet for standing rock and we'll show you how strong we could be when we unify. To Planet Earth, it's been spinning, we've been living and dying, but giving birth the first of many nations, celebrating them days when all that got made came after what got me. These days we cater to these internet memes, internet streams, it seems them streams aren't clean. We need the whole story seen, we're hassling before water has gasoline in it. 
Malcolm X moment. Martin Luther King with a dream and war boning. Wounded knee plus Alcatraz dog on it. This is for the rock with prayers we stand on it. Oh yeah, we playing on it. The earth we camp on it. In a sweat lodge singing the songs with grandfather's heat rocks all in the spot. We splash on them with a beatbox from my boy B. Jam on it. Said a prayer for the black snake killers. Train on the front lines, they you're the realest. Stand for your people. Stand for your family. Stand with standing rock. Stand for humanity. It takes a group of people who actually care about, you know, Mother Earth and life and water being sacred and the land being sacred to say, we stand up. To all my native people, recognize yourself, keep your head up. Mini Wachoni, water is life. Mini Wachoni. Water, water is life. Water is life. Water is life. Water is life. I stand. I stand. I stand with standing rock. I stand with standing rock. I stand with standing rock. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. I stand with standing rock. Stand up. To all my native people, woke up the giant. We won't go quiet. To all my tribal people, don't mistake our peace as we stand and fight. To all my native people, it's the calm before the storming. I can hear it coming. To all my tribal people, I'm ready for the battle when we ain't running. Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Stand up. Is on a sad repeat. Is it liberty or we just acting free as our land depletes from these hands of greed? See, fate is found how we face the hounds. Take a vow for these sacred grounds. Make a sound that'll shake us out. Say aloud what can save us now. How many folks in the room actually knew that there were indigenous or Native American rappers? Yeah. The, and it's so important because sometimes when folks talk about hip hop, they don't know how expansive it is, um, how it has helped to, you know, move culture, how it has helped to touch so many different folks, and also how it is now connected to environmental issues, climate change issues, of course, a number of other social justice issues that gives us an opportunity to reach new audiences, to help to make real change happen. Now, I should say so that I don't get in trouble that... Uh, I am the son, of course, of my mother and my grandmother, who are the rocks that I stand on. People across the country hear me talk about them, and uh, I'm so thankful. But we should also honor the fact that we are standing uh, or sitting uh, on indigenous land. Um, so if we could make sure that we are honoring that, that would be important. So my mom and my grandmother, who are huge influences on me, told me when I was a really young boy that I was going to have some tough days. By a show of hands, how many folks in the room have ever had a tough day? Raise your hand up high. Everybody, hold it up high just for a second, if you can. I see a couple people who don't have their hands up. So what I want you all to do is run over and touch them real quick <laughs> and find out what kind of energy they got going on, because evidently they got the right stuff. But my mom and my grandmother told me that you're going to have to find a way to deal with those tough days. And if you've ever worked on social justice issues, civil rights issues, environmental justice issues, so many different issues out there that take a lot of energy, but they also give us the opportunity that we have to find a way to surround ourselves with positive energy. Now, I come out of a faith-based background, and there are all kinds of ways to surround yourself with positive energy, but my mom and my grandmother told me, find those words of empowerment, Every day since I've been 16 years old, I've said these words. I get up, I look in the mirror, except two times. And I'll tell you about those two times so you can blame certain things that may have happened on me. It's on Mustafa. But every morning I get up and I say I'm blessed and highly favored. Now, I know I may not have a whole lot of Baptist and Pentecostal folks in the house tonight. 
but we're going to try it. We're going to see how it plays out here in Michigan. All right. Here we go. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. And highly favored. And highly favored. Well, yeah, y'all didn't believe a word you just said, did you? <laughs> All right, I'm going to go over on this side of the room because I'm a little scared over here. Let's try it again. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. And highly favored. All right, so we're going to come together as a collective. I'm blessed, I'm blessed. And, highly favored. and highly favored. And we truly are because we have the opportunity to actually help make change happen. Now, that is a heavy responsibility, but it's also a blessing because we see some of the injustices that are happening uh, across our country, across the planet, and we have a choice. We have a choice if we're going to get engaged then we can get engaged in lots of different ways. Everyone is not going to be out on the front line marching, but everyone can have conversations with their families, with their friends, and others can get engaged in nonprofits, so many different things. Support the Weggie Foundation. How's that for a plug? You like that? <laughs> There's so many different things that we can do, and sometimes, you know, I'm blessed to work with all kinds of incredible scientists in this country and across, and they're all super smart and all so very needed. But I often say that if Mrs. Ramirez or Mr. Johnson doesn't get what you're sharing, then we got to figure out a different way of sharing that information. And sometimes we complicate these very, very important issues. I'll share with you what I mean. By a show of hands, how many folks in the room have taken a breath of air in the last 60 seconds. If you've taken a breath of air in the last 60 seconds, please raise your hands. Keep your hands up high. Let's find the non-air breathers. We got them in here, right? So normally there would be some slides rolling here in the background. Um, and you would see some of the places and spaces where in our great country, people can't literally take a breath of fresh air. Imagine that. Do me a favor. Everybody, take a deep breath in. Just hold it for one second. Let it out. I don't need anybody passing out. Just let it out. Let it out. Think about that. That's an autonomic response. It's something that we just naturally do. And when we do that, we expect that something positive is coming into our bodies. We don't have to travel very far to see places and spaces where this is not true. How many folks in the room knew? or know that 200,000 people in our country, some would label the greatest country on the planet, die prematurely each year from air pollution. How many folks? So some folks know that. Now imagine this. We have a huge amount of focus and energy on gun violence, and we should. More people are dying from air pollution than are dying from gun violence. More people are dying from air pollution than are dying from car crashes and auto accidents. Isn't that amazing? More people, and I want y'all to hold on to this one, because this one is one of those ones where we, we put a lot of attention and we should. More people are dying from air pollution than are dying from wars across our planet. And we know that there's a lot of war going on, right? Unfortunately. And we continue to pray and hope that we can make a change happen. So if we know that's going on, why would we ever do some of the things like try and stop the clean power plan, which is trying to help to limit some of the pollution that's going into our atmosphere, and of course, that's impacting many of our communities, or the mercury rule, um, or the refinery rule, all these different things that are out there. So those are all sort of statutory types of things, but let's, let's kind of bring it home. So we don't have to go very far, but down to Detroit, um, where we can see that over like 92% of some of the people in certain areas there are living with unhealthy air quality. And the beauty for many of you, hopefully, is that when you get up in the morning, when you lift up your window or the blinds that are there, hopefully you are looking out and you're seeing green space, you're seeing trees, you're seeing positive things. But for far too many people in our country, they are looking out the window and what they're seeing is stacks with emissions coming out of them, with flaring happening in them. And we expect folks to be able to survive, not thrive, but survive in those types of situations. 
There's something wrong with that dynamic. And that's the work that we can do to help make change happen. Or you have places like, how many folks in the room have ever been to Houston? Let's see. Oh, y'all travel. OK. I'm in with the big ballers tonight, right? <laughs> For all those people who say they have been to Houston, how many of you have been to the Ship Channel? Oh, so we got some adventurous three people. All right. Of course, it's not probably normally on your vacation or where you are visiting. But I want to give you an example. There is a community there. And please Google what I say, because you got far too many people who come and speak in front of you. And you're like, I don't even know if they told me the truth. The Manchester community there in Houston, Texas, primarily a Latino community, hardworking people trying to do everything right. And their community is surrounded by petrochemical facilities. People there have rare forms of cancer, liver and kidney disease. But they keep on trying. They keep on pushing forward. They keep hoping that someone will hear their cries, hear their ideas for change. And sometimes we're waiting for somebody to come and save us. And sometimes we have to save ourselves and hope that we'll be able to build partnerships with folks. How many folks in the room know someone who has asthma? Raise your hand if you know somebody who has asthma. I want, please keep your hands up. I want everybody to look around this room. Almost every person in this room has their hands up. Now, for some of our elders and others who are in the room, if we would have asked that question 50 years ago, 30 years ago, we probably wouldn't have had as many hands that go up. In our country, 25 million people have asthma. 25 million. Seven million children have asthma in our country. And disproportionately, it is African American and Latino children who are the ones who are losing their lives. If the photo was playing in the background, in that community, in the Manchester community, there is something called Cesar Chavez High School. So I had the opportunity to be there a couple of different times. And then earlier today, I was at City High. Incredible school, beautiful campus. And you all should be very proud to have that. At Cesar Chavez High School, um, they have a track, and they have the school that's there, and it's surrounded by these facilities. Now, I want you to think about something. If you, when you were a student, if you had to breathe that in every day, you may not be blessed to be sitting here in the same capacity that you are tonight. And they are expected to learn. How many athletes are in the room, or people who wanted to be an athlete? <laughs> I, I understand. I understand. I ran track in college and a little bit after. And I was thinking about when I first went there and I was looking at that track. And I was thinking about how hard it was as an athlete to be competitive. And I hope that that, there it is, Cesar Chavez High School. And you see a dynamic of folks who are training in these conditions where they're breathing in this type of pollution. And I'm wondering to myself, how could they ever survive? How could they ever be as good as they are? And that's the dynamic that we have going on in our country, that we have these types of places that we have to be laser focused. But we also have to have legislators who are willing to do the right thing. And sometimes that gets a little bit harder. That's Cedric the Entertainer. So everybody's always like, so what are artists doing? So Cedric has actually been using his celebrity to actually fight against some natural gas plants where his family was being impacted and a number of other folks inside of their community. By show of hands, how many folks in the last 24 hours have taken a drink of water or another beverage? <laughs> I, I knew I had to throw the other beverage in there for some folks. Everybody look around. Find the camels in the room, find them. Now, here in Grand Rapids, I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, the, the, the blessing and the opportunity that you have to be surrounded by so much water. Uh, and in Michigan, of course, by the lakes. And unfortunately, that's not the case across our country. Um, we know that about 60 million people in our country every year are dealing with unhealthy water quality. And we've got to stay focused on that. And we'll go a little bit deeper into that. And when we talk about water pollution issues or impacts to water, what's the one place do you think that no matter where I am, in this country or outside of the country, that people talk about? Right. 
is Flint, Michigan. And everybody knows what happened there. Or hopefully everybody knows about the, the water quality and the lead that was in the water and the impacts to young people and how, you know, not only does it mess with your kidneys and your liver, but it also lowers IQ points. And many of you who are parents in here work extremely hard to be able to provide an opportunity for your children to be able to go to college, right? Or to some other form of schooling. And imagine for the families who are there, again, trying to do everything right and to find out that your child has been lead poisoned. But here is something that no one talks enough about. In our country right now, not five years ago or 10 years ago, there are over 3,000 locations that have levels of lead than Flint does. Let that sort of um, find its way into your psyche. Because this is something that we thought we had won on a long time ago, right? We was like, oh, we got our hands around lead. And then Flint brought it back into national attention. Guess how many young people in our country have been lead poisoned? It's OK. You can shout it out. She said millions. Yes, 1.1 million in our country, the United States of America. Now, here's where I get a little concerned along with the impacts that are happening, when we have federal and state folks who are trying to cut lead programs. Now, how does that sort of sync up, right? If we know that we have this much of a problem, and you talk about cutting lead programs at EPA, you talk about cutting lead programs at HUD, you talk about cutting lead programs at CDC, what does that say about the value that we place on our children? Y'all feel me on that? And that's why we have to make change happen. And sometimes people will say, well, Mustafa, it's too expensive. You know, we just can't do everything, can't be every place. And luckily, I was raised by someone who was a genius when it came to math, but he also was a historian. So for his children, he wanted to make sure that we always understood where we've come from and also how not to make the same mistakes. So I love when people say, well, you know, you have to make a choice between the environment um, and jobs, or the environment and the economy. And you all being here in Michigan, um, in the car hub of the world for a number of years, probably remember when people said that we can't get lead out of gasoline. And if we do, we will crash the American economy. And people got worried, and they should get worried when someone says something like that, and you have to start to do the analysis of that. And of course, we know that our country was able to take lead out of gasoline to increase the mileage that cars got. And at the same time, the economy continued to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. So we changed sort of that paradigm that people were talking about. And you guys have all these wonderful lakes. So how many folks in the room Remember the conversations around acid rain. Mm -hmm. And you remember they said that if we began to work on that and, and to take out some of those pollutants that were causing that problem, that once again, we would crash the economy. We'd never be able to do it. It would be too expensive. And people were able to move forward. So now we have a new set of issues that are going on. We've got Gen X and PFOS and PFOA that's in our waterways, and folks are trying to figure out how to deal with that, and it is moving across the country. I know here in Michigan, it is a big, big issue that people are trying to focus on. And then we've also got these algae blooms. You know, people used to say, well, that's a Florida thing. You know, they had the red tide and all these other types of things, but now we see that some of these things are happening in locations all across our country, and we gotta get focused on it, because if we don't, then we know what some of these impacts are going to be. And of course, we've got the issues also with mercury now. And that's why, again, we need strong air pollution uh, regulations in place. Because if we don't, we allow some of this stuff to get out of control. And here's the other thing. Since I come from a set of work around environmental justice, let's transition real quickly to climate change. But before we get there, I want you to realize that those environmental justice leaders who for years were trying to get people's attention and saying, this pollution in our communities is killing us. But now, they also have the understanding that those fossil fuel facilities, those coal-fired power plants and other greenhouse gas emitting facilities 
are not only polluting people, but they're doing what? Warming up the planet. Those emissions are what's helping to drive what's going on right now. Also, that pipeline conversation that you saw from Taboo and the Magnificent Seven and others who are in there, the majority of those pipelines are running through low-income communities, low-income white and working-class communities, communities of color and across the indigenous lands, and no one wanted to give it the attention that it deserved, and now it is a part of the process that is warming up our planet. Our agricultural pro, um, sort of processes that are going on are also a big driver here uh, and throughout the lakes and some of the things that are going on in some of our rivers with Fisteria and some of the other things. So it's all connected and we all have to kind of come together. So it makes economic sense, but it also makes sense for humanity because last year we spent $450 billion in relationship to the climate impacts that are happening in our country. Everybody do me a favor, take your right hand, place it in your pocket or in your pocketbook. And imagine that the next time that you put it in there and you pull it out, ain't nothing in there but this old tissue that I got. <laughs> you see, sometimes we're like, ah, well, that's a long, far off problem. Or, we will say to ourselves that that's somebody else's thing that's going on. And we've got to get our minds around this because you all know last year, the hurricanes that came through, how many folks remember the hurricanes? I want to make sure because I know some folks, it's okay if you ain't got cable, you ain't got TV. I, I totally get it. A lot of that stuff is not even worth watching. No matter where you were from Texas all the way over to Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, up to Virginia, and on out, those hurricanes were devastating. And then, when you got to the islands, our US Virgin Islands, our brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico, devastated by Hurricane Maria. So let me give you some facts and not fake news. When they tell you 3,000 people died, 3,000 people died. And it didn't have to be that way, because we should be investing in the infrastructure that's necessary to support people, and we should be lowering these emissions that are going on. Sometimes folks say, well, I saw something on TV about the wildfires. Everybody saw the wildfires, right? That continue to go on. Some of the faces that you don't see is the farm workers who are actually working in the fields as those wildfires were raging. Sometimes because of the lack of uh, communication in the languages that were necessary, and sometimes because people were trying to maximize profits. So I want you to close your eyes once again. I want you to imagine that you're in those fields and you feel the heat that's coming off of the burning timber and everything else that's burning, along with the pesticides that are on the ground and that are on those trees, and that you have to breathe, and you're trying to figure out how you're going to get out of that situation. That's an environmental injustice. That's some of the things that people are dealing with. And then something that folks here in Michigan should be very, very focused on in relationship to the impacts of climate change are the floods that are coming and that are here. Because I have seen some stuff that just blew my mind in relationship to some of these floods that are happening. Back in Maryland, there's a place called Ellicott City. Anybody been to Ellicott City before? A few folks have, so you know it's sort of a historical spot. These folks have had floods, not 50-year floods, not 100-year floods, 500-year floods back to back. Soon as people rebuilt, it was gone again because of just these intense, intense uh, rain events that continue to happen. And this stuff is going to be happening more and more often. I want to go back to one of the blessings and one of the just incredible resources that you have because some students and I were having a conversation earlier. So you have all this water that's here and we know that you have to protect it. I know lots of folks who are here in the room are protecting it. Now I want you to think about something. As the planet continues to warm up and people who are further south have to move, both folks inside of our country and folks maybe who are an outside of country and who are looking for the opportunity to be near fresh water, 
where you think they're going to go? Because there are two things you have to have to live in the immediate. One is air, right? You can just go a few minutes without it. The second one is water. So if we want to make sure that people are protected, we want to make sure that our natural resources are protected, then we need to get very focused and very strategic about the things we need to do to lower the emissions that are going on across our planet uh, and here at home. And I know that that can be a bit scary for folks sometimes because it means that we may have to change some things and do some things slightly differently. Now, some folks know that I'm also with the National Wildlife Federation. And people are like, well, you know, you care about wolves and polar bears and, you know, squirrels. And I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> because I understand that that same air pollution is the same pollution that is impacting wildlife as well. And understand that the same water pollution is the same pollution that's having impacts on wildlife and our natural spaces. And that's why, you know, I see that connection and why we can all come together and help make real change happen. And for those of you who are business owners who are in the room and who are focused on how do we make sure that we're maximizing profit, well, we all know that renewables are the fastest growing uh, opportunity um, that we're facing right now. And I wish that the slide was up because there's this great slide about China and the investments that they're making in that space and how if we don't fill that space, somebody else will. We have the opportunity to take leadership. We have the opportunity to do good and do well at the same time. And that means we can protect the planet, we can protect communities, and we can have business and industry that's green, green and clean, and it's helping us to move forward and make real change happen. And at the Hip Hop Caucus, we also understand that when you see these young brothers um, doing you know, the, the beautiful things that they do, whether it's through dance or through rap, that culture is a driver in helping to make change happen. How many folks in the room know who Beyonce is? Oh, you never know, you never know. <laughs> I'd like to ask. <laughs> so you remember when the hurricane came through Houston, right? One of the first people who got engaged in that was Beyonce. Culture. Because one, she came from there, but she also utilized her celebrity to help to bring attention to the issues, to help to raise money. And what I love about some celebrities is that not only do they do that part, but then they do what our parents always told us, to roll up our sleeves. So she was right there passing out food, passing out water, helping people who didn't have clothes to have clothes, giving people hope again. All of us have the ability to be able to join into that. And you'll see all these other entertainers. You know, Jaden Smith, who's um, actually helping out in Flint and doing some things. And there's a laundry list of people who you may or may not know. I'm going to ask a question. I won't be surprised what the answer is. How many folks know who Snoop Dogg is? <laughs> what? Look at all y'all. <laughs> so Snoop, who's also been in Flint, and so many others. And you know, the beauty is, is that we don't have to just have those celebrities that when you turn on the TV, they're there. You have celebrities like these young brothers over here who are local and who are ready to give and give back and help make real change happen. And you have so many others. So we should be utilizing poetry. We should be utilizing all these other forms of culture to help to make real change happen. And I'll leave you all with this, because I'm looking at many of the faces that are here in the room. How many folks in the room believe that they have power? And you don't have to lie, it's all right. So we have a few folks, and that's normal. Because ask yourself a very honest question. When you were in elementary school, how many times did anybody teach you about power? Mm-hmm, exactly. That's honest, and I appreciate that. How about junior high school? Did they take you to power class 101? No? Okay, I'm right there with you. That great West Virginia education that I got. How many folks in high school went through power dynamics? One gentleman, two gentlemen. Okay, I appreciate that. I have a room of hundreds of people. Sometimes in our country, we think that we don't have power, so we disconnect from the process. We think that our voices don't matter, that our voices can't lead to change. I'm going to prove to you that you do have power. How many 
in the room remember the Women's March by a show of hands? All the ladies threw their hands up. And the gentleman was like this, oh Lord, he about to talk about the Women's March. And that's true because there were a whole bunch of men who said, I bet you a million women will never come together. And sister said, oh yeah? I got something for you. And a million plus women came together and they marched. But not only did they march, they took that energy back home and they said that if I can't find someone who will represent me, I'll run myself. Look at Capitol Hill now. Look at the state houses now. Yes. How many folks remember the science march? Yeah, you get a lot less hands, don't you? <laughs> I was there. Oh, somebody threw two hands up. He's like, I'm going to be a scientist. I was there. And I'm going to be honest with you. I did not think that scientists would come out their labs. And I, someone was like, Mustafa, is it safe? I said, yeah, it's OK. Come on. And they stuck their toe out, and it felt good to them. And then they came on out, and then they said, we're going to march? I said, yes, we're going to march. So I said, left, right. <laughs> left, right. <sighs> Don't even worry about it. Just march. Because, can I tell you all a secret? They didn't have a whole lot of rhythm. <laughs> but that's OK, because it wasn't about being on beat. What it was about was being able to utilize the power and the expertise and the knowledge that they have. And they began to utilize the Union of Concerned Scientists, the Thriving Earth Exchange, so many different scientific organizations took a look. And they said, well, the federal government is saying that science isn't real, science isn't important, and somebody else is going to have to fill that space. So those scientists began to work with community-based organizations to help them to understand some of the challenges and impacts that various chemicals were you know, having on their communities, that's power. How many folks have seen or been a part of Black Lives Matter? I think some of y'all just lying, but that's OK. <laughs> Black Lives Matter is another example of how injustice is happening and people saying, you know what? I've had enough. And I am going to raise my voice and utilize my bodies, just like you would have seen one of the pictures of the folks who laid down in Warren County, North Carolina, to stop those trucks from bringing PCBs into their community. There comes a time when people have to say, this is enough, and I'm going to do something about it. That's power. And I was blessed to be surrounded by so many of these incredible young leaders, both who have been focusing on gun violence issues and the students from Parkland, but also the incredible folks at This Is Zero Hour. If you don't know that organization, you should definitely check them out. The Sunrise Movement, so many of these youth-led organizations came together around the climate march. Yes. <laughs> and are making change happen. Young people are saying that we want to work in an intergenerational way with our elders and others. But if you're not willing to push, then we will lead ourselves, and we will get engaged, and we will help make real change happen. That's power. Now, y'all still saying, well, Mustafa, that sounds good. And yes, I believe that those things are important. Y'all do me a favor. Look to the person to your left. Boy, help your neighbor out if they don't know their left. <laughs> Look to the person to your right. OK. <laughs> Boy, you should turn the cameras that way, because it is really entertaining. <laughs> Reach your left hand out to the person on your left hand side, even if they're cool. Reach your right hand out to the person on your right hand side. There it is. It's OK. You can touch people. It's all right. This is not a Joe Biden moment. It's going to be all right. <laughs> I would get in trouble when I get back to Washington. <laughs> Woo. All right, do me a favor. If you can, boy, some people took their hand away as quick as they possibly could. <laughs> Grab the hands again of those folks. There you go. And everybody, if you have the ability, please stand. Yes, work it out. Work it out. Help your neighbor. Help your neighbor. 
We're going to have some real talk. Everybody say real talk. So I want you to think about something. How many times, it happens to lots of us, you're walking down the street, your cell phone might not even be charged, you see somebody who you don't want to talk to, you reach in your pocket, you pull your cell phone out and act like you're talking to somebody. Am I the only one? Uh, that's what I thought. Or, and we talked about this earlier, how many times have we gotten on an elevator? There's people on the elevator, we see those numbers and we stare at them like they're going to tell us the future because we don't want to talk to nobody. We're like, Lord, please don't let nobody ask me anything, right? We create these barriers between ourselves. You know, we, we put these, these walls in between ourselves to disconnect. Some of that is because, you know, we were taught, you know, not to engage with certain folks. But there's a change that's happening in our country where we're realizing that we have more in common than we do different. And that is power. That gives us the opportunity to make real change happen. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said that we come to these, sh these shores in different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. Isn't that something how prophetic some of our leaders were all those years ago? Marvin Gaye talked about mercy, mercy me. You know, he talked about some of the things that we're seeing play out now. But they also shared with us that we have the ability to make real change happen, that we have power. Everybody do me a favor. Everybody say power. Power. Once again, that was just pathetic. <laughs> They're like, I'm sorry, Mustafa. I'm just not sure if I'm allowed to say power. <laughs> power sounds good. I actually am afraid because it might get good to me and I might actually want to do some things. Let's try it again. Everybody say power. Power. Everybody do me a favor. Drop the hands that you have. Put your right hand in the air like it's 1968 at the Olympics. Some of y'all were there. So let's let folks in our state houses, in the White House, those who are making decisions understand that we're going to get engaged and we're going to make some decisions too, hopefully in collaboration, in authentic collaboration. Everybody say power. Power. I'm Mustafa Santiago Ali. Thank you all for a couple of minutes of your time. Can y'all do me one favor? Could I have y'all come back up on stage? Could I have all of you guys come up on stage? I want you to give them a round of applause. This is the next generation. It's the next generation. Yeah. All right, power. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. I mean, I've, uh, I think I've done talk to just about everybody in Grand Rapids. I've done nine events in the last 30 hours. So <laughs> I just want to just want to share one thing that's on my heart. And my mother always said, you should share with folks what you're thinking, what you're feeling. Um, you all have just something that is phenomenal that's here. And every place is going to have problems. I totally get that. Every place is going to evolve. But you have so many beautiful natural resources. And sometimes we look at the land and the water and those incredible, beautiful things that God has given us. But I want you just to look around this room also. This is the other natural resources that exist here in Grand Rapids. And these young brothers as well. And this is where true value is. These are your true national treasures. So I just want to thank you all for allowing me to be a part of this space and of the truth that you all are sharing and the journey that I know you guys are going on to make real change happen. So thank you so much. If you have any questions, please stick around for another 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, we have microphones here in the front, and Mustafa would be happy to answer anything that you have. Thank you. 
I never know how long I'm talking. Sometimes I blink and it's two hours, and usually when people start to lean over to the side, <laughs> I know it's been going on. So are there any questions? Yes, sir. I, I met you uh, yesterday. I'm Chris Weggy. I'm with the Weggy Foundation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just want, I was remembering when you were talking about, uh, you know, how people were putting up a fuss about if we were going to do anything for the environment, it was going to cost so much and so forth. Well, I just wanted to share with you the story about my father, yeah. Peter Weggy, starting the Center for Environmental Studies. I believe it was 1967 or 68, 67? I think it was 67. He started it two years, two and a half years before the first Earth Day, mm -hmm. okay? And there's a picture of him with these four uh, gentlemen that were working with him. So there's five of them, basically, that just started the Weggy Foundation, I mean, the um, Center for Environmental Studies. Mm -hmm. And they were the first ones to, you know, take some power and do something here in Grand Rapids. And guess what people said to him? What did they say? It's going to cost too much, Peter. You're going to make, you're going to make us all go bankrupt. So, well, thank you, thank you so much to your father and others. And um, so here's there, there's a guy that stood up. There it is. There it is. He knew what power was all about. There it is. And it's amazing because almost every place I've went since I've been in Grand Rapids and folks I've talked to have actually talked about how the Weggy Foundation was a catalyst that gave some support to help make change happen. And I hope we can get the, you know, many of our other foundations around the country to understand the similar types of investments that you guys have been making in people uh, to make real change happen. So thank you so much for what's been going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hey, Mustafa, thank you for coming today and for all the work that you're doing. I wanted to ask you a question um, with regard to our politics. It, it seems that we um, seem to be dominated by kind of a far-right conservatism right now. And the Democrats that we have in power seems to have a watered-down liberalism. And the types of people who are actually standing up for economic justice, social justice, environmental justice, we're, I don't know if they're calling themselves, I guess they, they're calling themselves socialists. Um, I'd probably consider them more progressives. Yeah. Socialism's a dirty word. Um, but they also seem to be the only ones that are really standing up for the justices that we're seeking. Mm -hmm. The Democrats seem to have more of a compromising mentality, and the Republicans seem to have an uncompromising mentality. So I'm wondering, what are maybe like three things that we should not compromise on? Sure. Clean air. <laughs> and Clean how do water. we do that? Uh, we get engaged. We continue to push. We continue to fight. But we also continue to look for allies um, and you know, getting out of our silos and, and building together uh, in an authentic way. And authentic means that sometimes our privilege, uh, sometimes you know, many of us have a whole bunch of letters after our name. We've got to, you know, we honor that. But at the same time, we got to put some of that to the side. And we got to sit down with folks um, and, and make sure that everybody's voice has power in the process, has the ability to mold the process, and then also that when we are utilizing resources that we're being honest in that space and helping those organizations that have been there on the front lines. I never understood how um, clean air and clean water could ever become a partisan issue. It just makes no sense, and it didn't used to be that way. You know, I just looked at some of the uh, bipartisan work that happened around the Farm Bill, you know, people came together and they were like, hey, we got to make sure that, you know, our farmland and those who are helping to feed our country have some of the things that they need. Now, no bill is ever going to be perfect, but it was good to see people coming together. And normally, and maybe I'll do this real quickly, sometimes I like to show folks how bipartisan support is working sort of on the local level. Uh, and tie it into some of, some of this environmental justice and climate justice so that we can get to a place where folks can see on-ramps or intersection points, doesn't matter if you're a Democrat, Republican, or independent, um, or if you're a businessman, or you're a grassroots leader, all this opportunity. So there's a project, and actually I'll be there in three days in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Anybody ever been there? Okay, two people. All right, three people. Um, so Spartanburg is a great example because it's a place that you might not necessarily think people are going to come together. And it's also a place where you don't necessarily think you're going to see a whole lot of positive actions around environment and climate. This is a community that if we drove across Michigan, we'd see uh, reflections of it in lots of places. 
So it's a place that had problems with some environmental issues, brownfields and Superfund sites. You guys know what those are, right? Those most toxic sites. Uh, and some of the folks who were there in the community had been impacted by them. There was a chemical facility. But they also had some other interesting dynamics. They had one way in and one way out of the community. Anybody ever grow up in a community like that? OK, I knew I was in the room with fancy people. That's all right. They also had seniors who had to travel almost a half an hour to get to health care. So imagine that dynamic if you're not feeling well or you're sick or you need regular appointments and you have to take a while to be able to get there on the bus. So they had that dynamic. They had food justice issues. How many folks in the room work on food justice issues? So we got a few folks who work on food justice issues. So there was no supermarket, you know, and there was a number of, a number of other dynamics that were going on there. How many folks in the room are from the South? OK, so this may get a bit tricky, but we're going to work our way through it. How many folks in the room know what shotgun housing is? OK, all right, so we got a few folks know shotgun housing. For those of you who have never experienced shotgun housing, you open up the front door, you can see out the back door. Does that make sense, everybody? Uh, and you know, for years, people were utilizing, when we talked about energy efficiency, and this is across the country, people utilize newspapers around the window seals and different types of things to, to help to control the temperature. So there's all these different dynamics. But I share that because people in this community we're spending three to $400 a month on their electricity costs in the summertime. And y'all know it can get hot in South Carolina, right? And they had lack of jobs, which we all have seen and experienced at different times in our lives, uh, and a number of other dynamics that were going on. So they got a $20,000 environmental justice small grant. They began to get people together and do things called charrettes or listening sessions. And folks began to take a look and say, I want to deal with some of these impacts that are happening in my community, but I also want some of the good stuff. You know, some of the stuff that other communities had, new green space and new housing and all these different types of things. So fast forward, and they built 144 partners, and those partners range from foundations to uh, both Democrats and Republicans, both on the local level, the county level, the state level, uh, and even folks on Capitol Hill got engaged, uh, along with a whole bunch of other folks, and took that $20,000 grant and I see somebody leaning on the end of their seat because they want to see what I'm about to say, and leverage into $300 million in changes in their community. What does that look like, Mustafa? So brownfields and Superfund sites have been cleaned up. The transportation routes that I forgot to mention is that when you had that one way in and one way out, they also had a train track that ran across the road. And trains would sit there and idle for hours. People were trapped. And if the chemical plant had an uh, emergency, they told folks to shut your windows, close your doors until the release was over. And that's why people were really, really scared. Because we all know that chemicals can make it through no matter if the doors are shut and the windows are shut. So remember the shotgun housing I told you guys about? They now have 500 new green homes. And those new green homes have got the electricity cost down to $67 a month. So that's huge for folks who are dealing with a fixed income and to help make change happen. They also got a new uh, 40,000 square foot green community center where seniors and young people come and there's exchanges of information and learning. That's powerful. They also got a supermarket in the area and a bunch of other businesses started to build around so it created economic opportunities as well as addressing some of the food justice issues. They put worker training programs in so all the rebuilding that happened in this community, it was the community members who are the drivers and the builders and most of it. That's powerful. Those brownfields and Superfund sites that were cleaned up, now there's a 35-acre solar farm going in. So instead of that three to $400 a month people were paying for their energy costs, down to $67 a month, it will now be zeroed out. That's powerful. Because communities are the ones who are leading this. They're putting in an aquaponics and a hydroponics a facility also that creates more jobs and also brings more fresh um, you know, fish and other things into the community. And all of this is possible because a whole bunch of different types of people started to come together and make change happen. So you had asked me the question about when we see all of this craziness that's going on, we got folks on one side saying that they have one set of beliefs and we got other folks who are fighting just for life uh, and trying to get folks to do the right thing. There are opportunities for us to come together, but we have to highlight these types of examples of folks coming together, but as importantly, of communities 
who are leading and pushing and helping to make change happen, and that is so powerful. And there's so many other aspects to this particular project, but what I like is that it's not by itself. There are a number of other projects across the country that never get any attention that are very, very similar things. Everyone from Reverend Floyd Flake in New York, uh, there in Jamaica, Queens, to Buster Saras in Jersey City, because I like talking about faith-based examples as well. Um, and, and there are a number of others. Or you can look at Miss Margaret May in Kansas City in the Ivanhoe community, where they were able to actually um, get rid of crack houses and get new housing in, create community gardens, create uh, opportunities for communities to come together in a cultural context. There are so many examples that we should be pushing our elected officials to understand how real change can happen and how there's opportunities for everybody to come together and do good and do well. So I answer your question that way so that it's not just a, a theoretical conversation of you know, conservatives doing terrible things and you know, Democrats on the other side or progressives on the other side and finding those sweet spots where people can come together. That doesn't mean that we don't have to hold people accountable when they're making crazy policy um, that's gonna shorten people's lives. So I'm sorry, I just gotta give real talk on that part also. <laughs> so I hope that that answers your question a little bit. See, you shouldn't ask me a question because I'm gonna give you a whole bunch. <laughs> so you got something you can go research and then you can take it back and hopefully push people to replicate. So with that being said, I know there's gonna be a reception um, so I don't want to take up too much time, but I do want to do one thing, if, if I have the ability to. I would like to ask everybody to come down here on stage, and I want to take a picture of all the incredible folks who are here in the room so we can share it with the rest of the country so they can see how Grand Rapids is getting down. Is that all right with everybody? All right, so everybody come on down.